Hey folks, it's now 5.55 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6-28-2019, I guess. Today, I'm going to be continuing uh, on the theme that I started yesterday. Now, yesterday, I thought I would actually be able to get to this book, which I'm going to be pulling heavily from. It's just that I had kind of forgot how much material there was uh, in that website. Um, so, I didn't get to this. And there was there was a lot of preemptive stuff, too, <clears throat> concerning America, <clears throat> the institutions in America, the National Geographic Society. We won't even have time to go into the Royal Society or the Royal Geographic Society. Suffice to say, and it it almost it's it almost borderlines on depression when you find out um, how many of the people in history, or and specifically the history of the United States, the history of England and Holland and Europe is another matter. It's going to have to wait. <laughs> till another time but when you find out how many um really prominent figures in united states history were either involved with um dark characters or were themselves how many were involved with secret societies and embroiled in really shady doings and how many of these people have a lot of mystery and a lot of vagueness concerning uh, their lives and their doings a perfect example is George Washington. I don't know how many people are aware that um, it's it's held as absolute fact by some revisionist historians that George Washington was a horrific individual. Um, you know, these silly stories about the honesty and uh, the cherry tree and all that. Um, according to revisionist historians, that kind of stuff couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, uh, there are some who s would stake their reputation on the claim that the French and Indian War was started by George Washington because he killed, as they uh, say, uh, a French officer in Ohio. And what he was doing there, you know, the reasons for him being there, I don't remember, but the claims by revisionists against George Washington are pretty astounding. Um, the idea that he was the reluctant president and the reluctant leader, they say, is hogwash. This guy was uh, extraordinarily ambitious and malevolent. And if there aren't enough revisionist claims against the sort of... Uh, spotless reputation of George Washington, there are plenty of claims against his vice, John Adams. Um, I can't believe, actually, how many books there are uh, concerning the very bad character uh, that some claim um, of John Adams. 
So John Adams was the vice president of George Washington. Um, <clears throat> Alexander Hamilton was the Secretary of Treasury under George Washington. Thomas Jefferson was the vice president of John Adams. And it was Thomas Jefferson's first vice Aaron Burr, who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. It is said that Hamilton and Jefferson were rivals. It is said that Jefferson would not renew the charter of the first U.S. bank that men like Hamilton uh, helped to establish and that it is the lack of renewal of that charter um, that led to the War of 1812. Now, Jefferson was already out of office by the time of the War of 1812. He had been out of office for a few years. Madison assumed office after Jefferson. One of the most well-known events in early American history because most American children and maybe a lot of children who are given um, sparse lessons in US history just as part of their world history from other countries may be familiar with the names Lewis and Clark. Um, Lewis and Clark are famous for their exploration of what was the Louisiana Territory and the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Territory was a, just a gigantic swath of land. Absolutely huge. Um, and if I can go back here, there is uh, an introductory map that shows the travels of Lewis and Clark and it outlines a bit of what was the Louisiana Territory and it covered roughly uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It, it covered probably about the area of maybe 18 or 20 modern day US states. Um, at the time around 1806-1807 when Lewis and Clark made their expedition which was about a three-year expedition the basically the the capital of what was considered the Louisiana Territory was St. Louis and St. Louis remained St. Louis and Missouri in general remained a, a very important center of activity. Uh, you know how there's that huge arch there, and they say that arch is there as a gateway to the West, and who knows if that's really the true symbolism of that or not. But there is a lot in the... <clears throat> I'm going to be reading from a book, uh, mostly, and it's called The Suppressed History of America by mostly Paul Schrag. Um, his co-author has got a relatively odd name. Um, most people uh, attribute the book to Schrag, but uh, Zaviant Hayes is the name of his co-author. And mostly they're, they're tracking the expeditions of Lewis and Clark and pointing out the discrepancies and inconsistencies with the establishment's narrative concerning America and Native Americans uh, and the history of America and uh, who may have been here before I guess we can say, you know, pre-Columbus. 
Uh, and I think that's very obvious. Um, there, there are many modern day researchers who are pointing out a lot of problems with even, even the narrative that we have today that supposes uh, a number of assumptions concerning like the infrastructure of the United States and how so much infrastructure was built so fast across the country. Um, there are a lot of anomalies just to this country. And something that I think, you know, should be taken into heavy consideration. Lewis and Clark, very famous uh, for tracking westward across the United States to the Pacific Ocean and back. Um, so Meriwether Lewis who was the head of that expedition. He was from an extremely prominent well-to-do family. I don't know of too many other Lewises. There are many. Lewis is not an uncommon name. The only Lewises I'm aware of today would be like Richard Lewis. Uh, Lewis is a common name among a certain people. However, Meriwether Lewis, his family was very close to Thomas Jefferson's family. Um, Jefferson inherited Monticello and all the holdings of his father when he was very, very young. Meriwether Lewis was moved down south into, I believe, Georgia for quite some time and then moved back because he lived very near Jefferson's Monticello for a good deal of his young life and his family were from around there for generations. Um, he became, uh, after a career in the military, which, by the way, he was court-martialed. Lewis was court-martialed five times while in the military and the reasons for this and everything surrounding it and how he got out of five court martials is not common information I'm not privy to it at this point in time but that's five times which after his military career I'm gonna read a little bit from the book from page 112 uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, now this is from the chapter Friends in High Places. They say, in this specific regard, the disagreements between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson were at a fever pitch. They were famous, potent rivals. Jefferson was aware of Hamilton's allegiance to a nefarious cult that the president believed was plotting a takeover of the young United States by creating a central bank that would control the country's currency. Jefferson was suspicious of Hamilton's association with the Rothschilds and feared betrayal. It's no secret that most of the founders were in the frequent company of Freemasons. Although he never claimed to be one, Jefferson visited Masonic temples and had high-ranking Masonic friends, such as Benjamin Franklin, Jefferson used this access to acquire the knowledge he felt was going to be used against the founders by usurpers who were gearing up for war. Now, guys, sometimes these authors really look at history through very rosy-colored glasses. Um, I cannot honestly know what I know about the history of this country and people like Jefferson, Adams, Washington and so on, and even about Jackson, and all of the propaganda about Jackson. Um, he was so unpopular because he, he was at war with the bank. When you come to find out that it was just that he was in league with alternate factions, it wasn't that he was a creator for goodness. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case also with Jefferson. The factions uh, that you see at war with one another uh, 
in early U.S. history, even up to this present day, uh, it's very interesting. It, it gives you, for one thing, it gives you the insight that the powers that be are not specifically monolithic nor unified. Uh, you know, they may unify in certain ways to retain their power. Uh, however, they're, they're not unified in the sense that they all think with the same mind um, and don't war with one another. I think they frequently are warring and fighting with one another for power. Now, <clears throat> continuing, um, both Lewis and Clark were Masons as well. In fact, Lewis was known for achieving high rank among American Masons in almost record time. Lewis was elected to the Door of Virtue Lodge in January 1797 and had climbed the ranks to past Master Mason within three months. By 1799, he had attained status of Royal Arch Mason in Widow's Sun Lodge at Milton, Virginia. Shortly thereafter, Lewis had been chosen by Jefferson to be his private secretary. Now, I've heard various stories about people who are what they are is they typically come from prominent families and they tend to already be in the know and in certain high positions when they're offered the status of Mason and then they are promoted very quickly in the Masonic Lodge usually to uh, Master Mason. Some people, depending on what right it is, would say a 33rd degree or Master Mason. In this case, Royal Arch Mason, because uh, this author isn't saying whether this is Scottish Rite or York Rite Masonry. And there's some oddities about those two things. And there's some oddity about Masons, uh, the Freemasons, and various factions of, of Freemasons earlier in history and how it spread the denunciation of it in Europe and in early America. But I would say by the time we get to like Thomas Jefferson, we're looking at um, <clears throat> an organization that was far more unified than it was a century earlier uh, and far more infiltrated and not by the Catholic Church um, look into movements like Martinism and you'll see by who if you realize that Benai Barith was spawned from masonry and odd fellows you'll start to get the idea so strangely enough this Meriwether Lewis was past a master mason royal arch mason before he was ever sent on this journey um, he basically recruited Clark uh, into the Masons as well so by the time they're uh, through with their journey and back and being appointed to very high offices um, both of them are Masons one a Royal Arch Mason so you couldn't be you probably couldn't be more in the know than a guy like Meriwether Lewis and to be in direct opposition uh, to some people in what they believe and say about masonry, um, I would say that the secrets that one is 
looking to attain by climbing the ladder in masonry is not the sort of uh, esoteric kind of, of secrets that I think a lot of people tend to get in their heads. I think the secrets that they tend to attain are more, if I could say, practical secrets as far as how the world really works, uh, how the monetary system really works, um, the true history of the world, nations, peoples, geography. It's no mistake that these institutions that are controlling public knowledge concerning history, geography, ethnology, language, were all begun as secret societies and still at the top function as such to this day. I don't think it's, there's any mistake to it. So, like with a number of Masons and people involved or embroiled in secret society and highfalutin doings, Meriwether Lewis met a very violent, gruesome death that officially was <laughs> called suicide. Apparently, he stabbed himself multiple times and realized that wouldn't work, or at least cut himself, <laughs> realized that wouldn't work, and then shot himself in the chest and the back of the head. I guess one of those shots must have finally done it. But I don't know if I'm going to read much on his death. What I'm going to do is read some of the oddities that um, these authors bring up about America and, and keep this in mind. Most of what they're pulling from uh, are what exists of the diaries of Lewis and there's not much, uh, there was a lot of controversy over just, just getting those published. Now, a number of the men in this expedition kept a journal of some sort, and a lot of this has been pieced together from various journals and diaries, but it really seems to me, from the explanation of this author, that uh, it wasn't easy to get these things published. I think that they went through a lot of filters. I don't think anyone was free to necessarily speak freely uh, about their travels and what they saw and who they interacted with. And given the fact that a full year of time out of three years, one-third of the time and things they did um, has been missing from Meriwether Lewis's journals. Now that's astounding, especially when you consider that the federal government was paying him as the leader of this party to keep track of all of these things. He was specially trained in, uh, believe me, they had him in mind long before this actually happened, because he was specially schooled in, in botany and ethnology and etymology and all kinds of special skills he would need to record a lot of data that he came across. And he was being paid handsomely by the federal government, so by the people, to do what he was doing and for a full third one year out of three to be missing from his journals and when you consider all of the intrigue that followed him directly after this and the fact that he died not long after all of this while he was still trying to get 
his journals published and the sparsity of other men's journals that we have and how difficult it's been to, to put together a lot of information. Um, I would think anybody would smell a rat. So uh, the, the main crux of this book is the Lewis and Clark expedition. However, um, there's a lot of alternative history background they're going to be giving too and I'm going to be reading from some of that. It's going to be mainly a few incidents or happenings um, that in a way relate to the Lewis and Clark expedition and in another way it th these things call into question uh, everything that we've been told concerning the, you know the the mainstream accepted version of the history of and after knowing and hearing everything I have about the, Ar the US Army Corps of Engineers and the Rivers and Harbors project and how much it would appear that they refaced the land in the western United States and we don't even know how much and again, like I mentioned yesterday, the places that they turned into either national forests or parks, protected areas, these huge, 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 huge areas of land that are in very suspicious places that they basically put on lockdown. Uh, I would think that all of these things together would just keep stacking up and stacking up and stacking up. And I, I would be concerned why more people weren't asking questions like why out of every land that exists in the world is the United States, well, not is, but has, why has the United States had so much effort put into it by so many very powerful people and you know the more powerful I, I believe that when you get high enough in power these people know the real history of the world these people know down to the year and month how long it's been since the advent of Christ these people know because that's part of and I think that's that's a huge part that's an integral part of what these people learn who climb to these very high echelons of power or are born into it the real history um, the real sciences the real understanding of our world how it works and why it is out of anybody that is currently existing in this world they're those are the people that would know and understand all these things that they they have worked very hard to keep away from the understanding of let's say the common man like myself or you <clears throat> and out of all the lands in the world that they've worked so hard and so meticulously to keep out of the general knowledge of you and I North America ranks right at the top of that list. Now consider something. All the lands that <clears throat> possession was taken of early uh, as recorded in the Bible from Genesis through Deuteronomy, these lands had to be taken from giants you had and and forget about Nephilim that's only mentioned in Genesis 6 and I think it's poorly translated and then mentioned again in numbers 14 uh, I don't think that that is necessarily meaning giants um, I think that a far more appropriate uh, term for giants is the Rapa or Rapaim uh, as a general term um, however, 
specific tribes and tribal names are given. And, and there are many of them. You have the Onakim uh, that dwelt in Hebron or Habron. You have the, um, the Awi or Awim that dwelt in the area that had to be taken by the descendants of the Palshatim or the Philistines. Um, there was the Zemzem or Zemzemim uh, that were in the land uh, taken by um, one of the tribes of uh, Abram's nephew Lot. It would be the, uh, uh, the Ammonites or the uh, Almuni, or commonly known as the Ammonites. So they had to expel the Zemzem, or Zemzemim, um, Oshu, or Esau, and his children. Uh, he had 11 uh, dukes, or Alep, they're called, Alup. They had to expel um, both uh, a tribe of, of giant people called the Harim, uh, and also... The I'm looking through this in Deuteronomy 2 as I go because there are a number of various tribes that are named. Uh, so, yeah, the uh, Amim. So there's the Amim and the Harim they had to expel. And then let us not forget uh, <clears throat> Og of Bashan and his whole tribe, which are just called by the generic name uh, Amory, as is Sahun, which was to the south of him, also called Amory, as are most tribes blanketed as Amory at one point or another in the Bible, which is why I wrote the paper The Land of Amory, uh, because that's a blanket term used in a very similar way as Kanoni except Amory is actually used as even a larger blanket term than Kanoni. So, in the case of Aug of Bashan and his tribe of Amory, he was the largest among them. He was probably about 15 feet tall, and he was the chieftain of that tribe. And keep some of these things in mind. So they had to be expelled. They were expelled. It doesn't say that they were all killed off. Plus, in Genesis 14, when there is a league of five kings, and these kings are not from uh, around the lands of, of Canaan. They come from another land. And they're basically going through the land and looting and killing and pillaging and stealing people and resources. They end up um, stealing Abram's nephew Lot and his family and his resources, and that's who Abram goes and rescues with a lot of people that were already in his company that he brought to the land of Canaan. He selected 400 young trained fighting men of the people that he brought with him. He was no small force. These movies that show Abram and, and Sarah or Abram and Cherie and, and Lot and, and maybe just a few other people with them is ridiculous. But anyways, they were, those, those five kings, uh, they were, um, they were killing giants in various lands also. These giants weren't exterminated. They were simply pushed out of the lands in which are described that the Bible takes place. Um, it doesn't say that any of them were necessarily exterminated. So keep that in mind. Now, in chapter 7 of this book, The Suppressed History of America by Paul Schrag, Chapter 7 is called Giants in Ancient America. And just from the start, he says, or writes, Meriwether Lewis described 
as a giant of American history, may have been preceded by an entire race of real historical giants. Despite being a prominent theme in all the world's mythologies, the lore about giants generally remains in the realm of children's tales. It seems odd that the ancient peoples from different parts of the globe would all write and speak of an age of giants. In Genesis 6-4 offers there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown, and I think that passage is horrifically, terribly mistranslated to get people's attention off of what it's really talking about. But I digress. Some other time. He continues, in another famous biblical account, we learn about the battle between David and Goliath. While digging at Tel es Safi in 2005, archaeologists from Bar Ilan University in Is Not Real discovered pottery sherds mentioning the name of Goliath. Yes, I'm sure they did. I'm sure that's accurate. I'm sure that's genuine. The writing on the shards represents the oldest Philistine inscriptions ever found. Yes, yes, of course they do. And now, let's get to um, archaeology and accounts. Forget the archaeology. Let's go to accounts from American history that are a little bit more substantial than archaeology that is offered up by well, the type of people over in Palestine. And, you know, considering the motives that they might have to, well, possibly plant bogus archaeological evidence. So, further on down... Um, <clears throat> We get into, now, in 1519, Alonso Alvarez de Pineda mapped the lands along the Gulf Coast, strategically marking the various rivers and bays, noticeable landmarks and porting areas, all of which belong to the King of Spain. After covering the coastlines from Florida to as far as Tampico, Mexico, Panetta sailed back to the mouth of the Mississippi River. Panetta was the first Spanish explorer to venture up the mighty Mississippi. <laughs> so they say. And he reports finding a large settlement of native villages inhabited by giants. After the giants proved to be friendly, Panetta and crew settled among them to rest and make repairs. Panetta detailed the abundance of gold found in the river and how the natives wore plenty of gold engraved ornaments. That's the Mississippi River, folks. It's amazing how Panetta was more interested in the lands, good food, and the shock of discovering giants than he was in gold. As he sailed back to his home base in Jamaica, he made note of more giants encountered on the various islands of the Texas coast. When Panetta returned, he presented Francisco de Garay, the Spanish governor of Jamaica, with the maps and sketches of the entire Gulf Coast. The first known map of the Gulf also included Panetta's writings about the fantastic race of giants living there. These sketches and writings are known as Garay's Sedula and were archived by the famous Spanish compiler Martin Fernandez de Navarit. They can be found today by visiting the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, Spain. So if any of you have got some time in your hands and can get over to Seville, there you go. Twenty years after Panetta mapped the Gulf, Francisco Coronado marched with a huge expedition across the American Southwest, searching for the legendary seven cities of Cibola, or what we refer to today as El Dorado. While on their quest, Coronado's expedition crossed paths with 
several tribes of Indian giants. We have this information thanks to the writings of Pedro de Castaneda, who accompanied Coronado and wrote the complete and amazing history of the expedition, a fascinating tale concerning giants found in Castaneda's book details the journey made by Hernando de Alarcon. Low on provisions, a frantic Coronado sent Alarcon to find a river that could bring supplies more easily to the Spanish outposts along the California and Mexican coasts. After nearly destroying his ships, and missing the waiting party at the rendezvous point, Alarcon haphazardly floated up the mouth of the murky Colorado River. Alarcon and his men became the first Europeans to fight the rough rapids as he brought his fleet into the heart of the Colorado River, reaching as far as the lower reaches of the Grand Canyon. While coasting up the river, Alarcon and his men came upon a settlement of an estimated 200 giant warriors. These giants, amazed by foreign intruders on the riverbanks, were ready to attack. But Alarcon defused the situation by making peace and offering gifts, which eventually won them over. These giants were later categorized with the prevailing tribes of the area as being the Cocopa Indians. A thousand more members of this giant tribe were discovered and reported farther upstream. Discoveries of giants have also been reported in Mexico. The Dominican friar Diego Duran is responsible for writing some of the earliest Western books on the history and culture of the Aztecs. His family moved to Spain to Mexico City, from Spain to Mexico City, where he was very young, which allowed him to grow up around the remaining natives of Mexico. While attending school, he was frequently exposed to Aztec culture. Then, under the colonial rule of Spain, he continued to study and travel within the remaining city states of the Aztec Empire in Texcoco. Texcoco? He learned to speak and read the native Nahuatl Aztec language. By winning the Aztecs' trust, he was able to gain access to a vast amount of knowledge concerning the history of pre-Columbian Mexico. His writings are some of the oldest known surviving texts that give us actual first-hand narratives from the ancient Aztecs. Because he spent 32 years among the Aztecs gathering information, learning how to read ancient native hieroglyphics, and interviewing old shamans, scholars regard Duran's work as extremely important. <clears throat> In The History of the Indies of New Spain, he exhaustively describes the history of Mexico from its mysterious ancient origins up to conquest and occupation by the Spaniards. In these writings, the Aztecs were not shy when it came to talking about giants. But Duran didn't need to hear or read about them, he could see them. While living in Mexico, he came in contact with giant Indians on several occasions. Writing about these encounters, he says emphatically, It cannot be denied that there have been giants in this country. I can affirm this as an eyewitness, for I have met men of monstrous stature here. I believe that there are many in Mexico who will remember, as I do, a giant Indian who appeared in a procession of the Feast of Corpus Christi. He appeared dressed in yellow silk, and a halberd at his shoulder, and a helmet on his head, and he was all of three feet taller than all the others. Bernal Diaz del Castillo marched as a swordsman in the army under Hernan Cortes during the conquest of Mexico. After surviving these expeditions, he lived to be an old man and wrote what is regarded as an exceptionally accurate narrative of the famous campaign. His book would come to be known as the true history of the conquest of New Spain. Unfortunately, Diaz died before seeing his book 
published. Fifty years later, the manuscript was found in a Madrid library. It was finally published in 1632. The book provides an eyewitness account of the conquest of Mexico, and it remains one of the most significant sources documenting the collapse of the Aztec Empire and the Spanish conquest of Mexico. Diaz recounts the history of the now defeated Tlaxcate Indians, mentioning a race of enormous giants that had once inhabited their land. During these encounters, Diaz even had the chance to examine first-hand evidence of this long-forgotten race. He writes, They said their ancestors has to had told them that very tall men and women with huge bones had once dwelt among them, but because they were a very bad people with wicked customs, they had fought against them and killed them, and those of them who remained had died off. And to show us how big these giants had been, they brought us the leg bone of one, which was very thick and the height of an ordinary sized man, and that was the leg bone from the hip to the knee. I measured myself against it, and it was as tall as I am, though I am of a reasonable height. They brought other pieces of bone of the same kind, but they were all rotten and eaten away by the soil. We were all astonished by the sight of these bones and felt certain there must have been giants in the land. An Italian scholar from Venice, Antonio Pigafetta, traveled with famous Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan and his crew on their voyage to the Indies. During the expedition, Pigafetta became Magellan's assistant and kept an accurate journal and detailed the various encounters with native giants. In Magellan's Voyage, a narrative of the first circumnavigation, there are numerous references to giants. Pigafetta amusingly writes, We had been two whole months in this harbor without sighting anyone, when one day, without anyone expecting it, we saw on the shore a huge giant who was naked and who danced, leapt, and sang, all the while throwing sand and dust on his head. Our captain ordered one of the crew to walk towards him, telling this man also to dance, leap, and sing as a sign of friendship. This he did, and led the giant to a place by the shore where the captain was waiting. And when the giant saw us, he marveled and was afraid, and pointed to the sky, believing we came from heaven. He was so tall that even the largest of us came only midway between his waist and his shoulder. Pigafetta was among the surviving 18 men who returned to Spain in 1522. The other 240 men of the expedition all died, including Magellan. Around the same time that Magellan was having his difficulties, the famed Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci was charting the Caribbean islands off the coast of Venezuela. Amerigo, for whom one-third of the world would later be named, which is nonsense, because he changed his name after the Americas were already established under the name the Americas. So, anyways, he wrote about giants he encountered on the modern-day island of Curacao. Recounting this experience, Vespucci writes, We landed to see if we could find fresh water and imagining that the island was not inhabited because we saw no people. Going along the shore, we beheld a very large footprint of, of a man in the sand. We judged if theirs or other members were of corresponding size, that they must be very big men. As Vespucci and his men ventured into the island jungle, he writes, we discovered a trail and set ourselves to walk in, its two, in it two leagues and a half inland. We met with a village of twelve houses, in which we did not find anyone except five women, two old ones and three girls, so lofty in stature that we gazed at them in astonishment. Vespucci and his men were invited to eat and drink. While doing so, they formed a plan to kidnap the three exotic girls. But their plans dissolved quickly when the giant men of the village returned, in a state of anxiety. <laughs> 
Vespucci recalls, while we were thus plotting, 36 men arrived, who entered the house where we were drinking, and they were of such lofty stature that each of them was taller when upon his knees than I was when standing erect. Men that were so well built, it was a famous sight to see them. They were of the stature of giants in their great size and in the proportion of their bodies which corresponded to their height. When the men entered, some of our fellows were so frightened that at the moment they thought they were done for. The warriors had bows and arrows and tremendous oar blades finished off like swords. When they saw our small stature, they began to converse, converse with us to learn who we were and where we came. We gave them soft words for the sake of amity and replied to them in sign language that we were men of peace and that we were out to see the world. In fact, we judge it wise to part from them without any controversy. So we went by the same trail by which we had come. They stuck with us all the way to the sea until we embarked. Vespucci and company made it safely back to their boats and fired off a few shots from their guns. The frightened giants scattered back into their villages and Vespucci sailed away. He promptly named Curacao the Isle of Giants. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And they talk a little bit about Buffalo Bill Cody, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard how it was said that he was presented with these very large bones and said that uh, the Indians that he was with at the time said that there was a race of people that they were aware of. Now, this is in a completely different part of the country. This is in the American west now we're talking about buffalo bill cody um they said that these giants were three times the size of men that they could outrun buffaloes yada yada now this is going to be uh from a portion of buffalo bill's writings he says these giants denied the existence of a great spirit when they heard the thunder or saw the lightning they laughed and declared that they were greater than either. Now, this is what he was told by these other Indians that had showed him these bones. This so displeased the great spirit that he caused a deluge. The water rose higher and higher so that it drove these proud and conceited giants from the low ground to the hills, thence the mountains. But at last, even the mountains were submerged, and then those mammoth men were all drowned. After the flood had subsided, the great spirit came to the conclusion that he had made man too large and powerful, and that he would therefore correct the mistake by creating a race of men of smaller size and less strength. This is the reason, say the Indians, that modern men are small and not like the giants of old. The story has been handed down amongst the Pawnee for generations, and they claim that this story is a matter of Indian history. But what is its origin, no man can say. I'm just going to mention a couple other things from this chapter. <clears throat> One is that the bones that were given to Buffalo Bill Cody, it is said that he gave them to a museum, and that museum promptly lost them. Interesting. I'm not going to go into the page or so that they have on Lovelock Cave, because I imagine every one of you who have heard anything about giants have heard the story of Lovelock Cave and the large red-haired um, white giants that were trapped in there by other tribes and they killed them by smoke inhalation. And then later on, a professional fertilizer company unearthed all kinds of stuff in that cave. There's those stories. There's a story so funny in Belize now, it was National Geographic that ran a story on this, and you can bet that they're not going to reveal anything telling. And they didn't. It was, um, well, let's see. What it turns out is it was the Belize Institute of Archaeology. They were diving in an area where there were these huge fossil beds 
about 60 to 90 feet below the surface. Um, and though the divers from the Belize Institute of Archaeology believe that there were gigantic bones down there, uh, the official story is they didn't want to disturb these giant bones because they weren't sure if they were fossilized or not. So they only brought back with them some small bones to study. So that seems to be a pretty interesting repeating story. Now, I know that some people might say, well, I've heard or seen stories of giant skeletons being unearthed in this place or that place or the other place. Uh, and what's strange is these same kinds of sources that are covering up all of the stories and all of the bo I mentioned in my last video that the Smithsonian was finally charged with suppressing finds of giant bones, giant skeletons, sometimes in armor, sometimes with weapons and other things. So now that's public record, but of course it didn't make it into our media so that all of us knew about it, did it. Now, you may have heard stories of giants or giant skeletons being discovered in other lands. Interesting enough, the same sources that have worked very hard to suppress the plethora, I mean the huge plethora, of giants encountered by people searching America in the 1500s, 1600s, are the same sources that would publish things about giants or giant remains in other lands. The strange thing is, there's more actual accounts of real flesh and blood giants in North America than any other place on Earth. Um, and this is not cases of giantism, which is a degenerative disease like Andre the Giant had. No, these are men that are reported to be far bigger than he could have ever imagined being, and perfectly proportioned and in good health. We're talking about a very different kind of creature than, say, an Andre the Giant. And they were massively prolific in North America, and they have suppressed it and suppressed it and suppressed it. One other thing they mentioned earlier in the book is another story about a tribe of Indians that was encountered by Ponce de Leon. Um, the uh, tribe he encountered, I believe it was near Tallahassee, and the chief of the tribe was this huge giant of a man. And that seems to be the way of it in many, many accounts that I've read of, of giants encountered in North America. Interestingly enough, um, although they're typically called Indians, and you have to also keep in mind many of the tribal names that we've come to be familiar with today were given by Europeans and are not necessarily the names that these tribes went by. And that is, of course, another <laughs> confusing aspect to all of this. It would be far better if we could just get the names that they went by. But I think that's all part of the very deliberate effort to suppress the actual history of North America and America in general. America, Canada, Mexico, sure. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that like the story of the Lovelock Cave, <clears throat> in which these giants were Caucasoid and red-haired, the giants and the tribes encountered 
in North America were varied as far as their race and their look. And we're going to see that in another section of this book that goes into the Mendons. And Lewis and Clark stayed with these Mendons, as well as other people have stayed and written about these Menden people. <clears throat> now, it really makes you wonder, uh, since St. Louis and the Louisiana Territory uh, had been inhabited for many long years before Lewis and Clark set out on their expedition, what happened to those tribes of giants encountered while that Spaniard was sailing up the Mississippi? All of a sudden, they're not talked about anymore once Lewis and Clark is going on their expedition in the 1800s. I think a whole heck of a lot of things, more than just giants, have been destroyed uh, and erased from history. And I also think a lot of what they've tried to destroy and erase from history, a lot of this factors into many of these mysterious disappearances in national parks. And hopefully I'll be able to talk a little bit more about my theories concerning that, um, because I thought I would just do at least a few of these videos um, on America, because um, I think they're really great groundwork to a lot of other things uh, that I've been working on anyways. So that's, that's all I'm going into for this one. So until the next one, uh, take care, everybody.